This is TWIS, This Week in Science, episode number 568, recorded on Wednesday, May 25th, 2016. A force of nature! Hey everyone, I am Dr. Kiki, and tonight we are going to fill your heads with noisy dolphin snot, cow dung, and clouds. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! Regardless of what is about to happen, do not panic, though you may want to take this opportunity to grab a towel. A towel, as I am sure you know, is the most massively useful thing a minion of science can have, especially practical in dangerous times when one really, really, really wants to panic. You can wrap it around you for warmth as you slurry across the Arctic melt counting polar bears. You can lie on it while etching meticulous layers of sediment away from a found fossil. You can sleep under it beneath the radiation and stars which shine so steadily on Mars. Convert it to a sail and free yourself from a castaway's fate of island dwarfism. Wet it and use it for hand-to-hand -hand combat or simply to ward off cats. Wrap it around your head to ward off noxious fumes or to protect yourself from traumatic insemination. You can wave your towel in emergencies as a distress signal, as long as that emergency is not a hungry polar bear that has been lurking about and now thinks you are waving it over, ready to be eaten. And of course, you can use it to dry yourself off with if you have recently showered in the knowledge that is This Week in Science, coming up next. Every kind of mind I can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? This week in science What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? This week in science Science to you, Kirsten and Blair. And good science to you, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Oh, it is Towel Day. Happy Towel Day to everyone. And also, welcome to this week's episode of This Week in Science. We have a great show ahead tonight, full of science as usual. I hope you are ready. Batten down the hatches, pick up your towel, use it as a seatbelt. Because on this week's show, we've got stories about the formation of clouds, a connection between cows and dung beetles, and red geysers. Red geysers, yeah. What do you have for us, Justin? Uh, what did I bring today? I have got uh, marsh maladapted marshmallows. Uh, <laughs> I have millions of venomous creatures and a Nubian Egyptian... Nubian Egyptian Egyptian Nubian culture mashup. Awesome. And Blair, what do you have? Oh, I brought some invertebrate sex. I brought dolphin snot, and I brought a man-eating crocodile. You're <laughs> welcome. Also, happy Turtle Day to everyone. That was a couple of days ago. So uh, yeah, strap on your carapace day. and your plastron for this episode. <laughs> Are we going to do some downhill turtle slaloming? Got it. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not. That would be fun. <laughs> Maybe not. But, okay, let's dig into the science. I have got a crazy story uh, that, seriously, this is going to make your head explode. You're going to want to do some downhill turtle slaloming after hearing this story. Story. Hungarian researchers at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences Institute for Nuclear Research in Debrecen, Hungary, have published on the archive preprint ser server and also in physical review letters this past January, but about this finding that they've worked in their lab to discover possibly a fifth fundamental force of nature. What? I know. What? How is Wait, this that, possible? We've already got... Four, and then we're, right. but now five? Right. This is going to make it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. So we have gravity, the electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the weak force. These are the four fundamental forces that kind of 
hold everything together and make everything work in the standard model. However, we've also got some stuff that doesn't quite make sense. Dark matter, for instance, makes up a massive proportion of our universe, and we really don't know what it is. And so people are searching for a particle. Also, this also. Krasnor Harke lab for in Hungary, for instance. What also? Oh, also chutzpah. We don't know where that comes from either. Oh, chutzpah. We also don't know where chutzpah. <laughs> no, we don't. It's kind of that, you know, the gestalt. Yeah. <laughs> where does it come from? So anyway, um, these researchers published their findings, and they said that maybe there's this new light kind of boson like particle that's not very much heavier than the electron that we just haven't noticed because you know it's not that big doesn't have a huge force so a bunch of researchers have been kind of following up on that especially after their physical reviews letter paper came out in January and so on April 25th there were other theoretical physicists who published their own analysis um, and they're the ones that conclude that it's probably not just a boson, but maybe this fifth fundamental force, that maybe it could be something. And these, uh, the lead researcher on this additional group study was published on uh, Archive, and the lead researcher, Jonathan Fang, is from the University of California in Irvine. So anyway, they were talking about this research. The Hungarian researchers have we're basically looking for something called dark photons. And so they are kind of, they, they're like photons, but they don't carry light. They're, they don't have that electromagnetic force that photons do. And they, um, they could potentially hold mass that would explain something about dark matter. So that's what they were searching for. They ended up firing a bunch of protons at these lithium-7 targets, little tiny lithium part targets. And that created these beryllium nuclei that decayed. And the decaying beryllium nuclei spat out all sorts of subatomic particles, electrons, positrons, whatever. And they were looking at what got spit, got spat out. And then they, um, they looked at the angle of the trajectory between the electron and the positron as they're spit, spat out. I guess it would be spat out. And they said that at about 140 degrees, this angle of electron versus positron, 140 degrees, there's a crazy emission spike. It just jumps all of a sudden. And they see this bump. And they calculated that it it's like a, a, it's probably a new particle and they say it, its mass is about 17 mega electron volts and that it's the, a particle that comes from the beryllium 8 nuclei that is being spat out and then it decays into this electron positron pair at a at this 140 degree angle they say they've done the ex experiment several times, tried to get rid of every possible source of error, and the Hungarian researcher, researchers, this lab, say they are really, really confident in their results. They say they've got like basically a 1 in 200 billion chance that this is something weird going on. So they are, yeah, 1 in 200 billion. So they say it's like a, this is this anomaly without it being something weird, I mean, it's just, they're pretty certain that this is something actual happening. So, the UC Irvine researchers and others, they're like, okay, it's not a dark photon. This isn't a dark photon. There's something going on there. They analyzed the anomaly, and they looked for other results that kind of jived with past experimental results. And so they think, they're calling it a protophobic X boson. Protophobic, protophobic X boson. And they think that it would carry um, short range forces, so like a, atomic, subatomic forces that would basically, they wouldn't even, the forces wouldn't probably get out of the diameter of an atom. It's just like the, from much, much smaller than the, the total size of an electron cloud of an atom, but basically on like nuclear level sizes. Uh, and so it was these, it's a very short 
short acting force and that um, it they think it's this is what it is and so this is what they're suggesting that this short acting little tiny force this boson is probably causing this new fundamental force but now there's a bunch of researchers who are like what really I don't know because you know scientists always do that it's like they think they've got something and then other scientists go wait a fifth fundamental force that's a little bit that's a stretch so now there luckily are a bunch of experiments coming online that are actually going to allow us to test it and that um, there's a dark light experiment that's looking for dark photons with masses of 10 to 100 mega electron volts and they are going to target specifically this 17 mega electron volt target now that they know it's there so maybe within a year we could be seeing something from the dark light experiment. Additionally, there's the Large Hadron Collider B experiment at CERN that is looking at quark anti-quark decays, and they also can look for this particular signal. So in the next year, we're going to have data on whether or not, number one, the 17 mega electron volt signal is a signal of any value which it probably is, but we don't know what it is yet. And then second, whether or not it has that potential to be a fundamental force that we've never found before, holding things together. Dun, dun, dun. Let's right. talk about rewriting your textbook, right? I know. All of a sudden, you're like, okay, we got to put something else in there. Fifth fundamental force. This proto photo, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Photophobic? It's like what, afraid yeah. of light? Yeah. Oh. Proto it's not photophobic. It's proto oh, proto protophobic. So it's yeah. it doesn't actually it, it's protons. So yeah. it's more likely to instead of um uh being attracted to electrons and protons, it's more likely to be attracted to electrons and um neutrons. Okay. Yeah. So just a different attraction level there which is very interesting. Um, and then another interesting study uh, going from the little tiny to the big giant things. Researchers have been trying to figure out why there are, are galaxies in our universe that don't seem to form stars. You know, like normally you've got these you know, areas of mat dust and gas and lots of mass and they start cooling down and things collapse on each other and they connect to each other and they condense and they end up forming stars like you just that's what happens when you have dust and gas kind of living together and working together in energetic parts of space but there are certain areas that are kind of like star deserts they have all sorts of mass but they don't have a lot of stuff. And the researchers actually have this analogy that's kind of fun. They're like, it's like a desert that has lots of clouds over it. And you'd think it would be raining all the time and causing all sorts of plants to be growing. But no, it's not happening. So it has all the stuff that's there, but the end result is no stars. So why do you have these quiescent galaxies? Researchers looking at um, a survey of galaxies called the SDSS4 Manga Survey, which is led by the University of Tokyo and involves the University of Oxford, have dubbed this phenomenon a red geyser phenomenon. Red because usually stars that are forming are in the blue spectrum of light, so they're not forming these blue stars and so you've got a red component of light more infrared the heat is what you see more more so um, and they're geysers because they're periodic in nature and what's going on is that these little these galaxies have black holes at their center that erupt in a periodic fashion kind of like the geysers in Yellowstone and they erupt and then they stop. And so they, when they erupt, these supermassive black holes drive massive interstellar winds through the galaxy that's around them. And the winds heat up the ambient gas and don't let it cool down and condense and form stars. Huh. Yeah. So because there are active supermassive black holes blasting the galaxies around them with the heat from their winds, there's no cooling, no condensation, 
of the star stuff and so no stars. And they think they they haven't done you know a massive I mean, this is a pretty big survey but they've only seen a few of them within this survey but they think this is a very very common phenomenon and can explain uh, this phenomenon across the universe. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty neat. It's very neat. So this um, SDSS4, Sloan Digital Sky Survey 4, Mapping near, Nearby Galaxies at Apache Point Observe, Observatory. SDSS4, Manga Program. Manga. I love that the Japanese got to use manga in one of their acronyms. That's fantastic. This is This Week in Science. Hey, Justin, what you got? Uh, I got back in the 70s. Uh, there were many assessments being made of preschool age children uh, in order to better understand the decision-making process of the strange small hominids, commonly known as toddlers. <laughs> One such test, widely uh, known as the marshmallow test, assessed impulse control. So the tiny humans were offered a single marshmallow and they were given a choice. Eat this marshmallow now. Wait, wait, no, don't eat it now. There's, I, I, there's more to it. I haven't finished it. Okay, give them all another marshmallow. Okay, but only after I've explained all the options. They, they would be offered either one marshmallow they could eat right now or the option to wait 10 minutes and have two marshmallows to eat. All right? Pretty simple test. Uh, children who displayed an apparent lack of self-control refusing to wait for uh, the more later, uh, were deemed maladapted. Which is kind of a harsh thing to call somebody <laughs> who's only in preschool. Like, I know. You're in preschool, heavy, you're maladapted. Pretty heavy label, right? But Justin, this is this week in science. So what's new about this story? Oh, uh, it's good you asked. I would have just left it there. So now researchers from the University of Rochester suggest that children raised in poverty may have been mistakenly labeled as maladapted because their seeming lack of self-control may actually be beneficial behavior based on the, that child's uh, environmental context. They were so, just hungry, guys. <laughs> right. So what they're saying, though, is that what looks like impulsiveness may actually be adaptive strategy. Kids who were brought up in homes with limited resources have learned it's advantageous to seize the moment, says Melissa Sturge Apple, Associate Professor of Psychology, University of Rochester, and Clinical Researcher at Mount Hope Family Center. For the new study, uh, the Sturge, Sturge Apple and colleagues measured vagal tone of preschoolers before they participated in the rewards-based experiments. Uh, so the, the vagus, vagus nerve? Vagus nerve, yeah. Vagus nerve. Uh, streams information from heart, lung, stomach, and other organs to the brain. It's associated with moderation of moods, including fear and anxiety. So the high uh, vagal tone is a psychological, psychological indicator of what we would call grace under fire. Abilities, the body's ability to slow down the heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, which can allow a thoughtful response. Previous research reward-based studies showed that children from uh, high-resource households have a high tone uh, is predictive of their ability to delay gratification. The higher the tone, the longer these children can delay, and they're able to keep calm, wait, and get more marshmallows uh, by the end of this. So, so they might even skip the two marshmallows and go, I can wait another 20 minutes if it's four. Like, I'm good. Like, can we do it again? All right. So the Rochester study, uh, published in Psychological Science, Children from low-resource households that have the high vagal tone did not demonstrate the same behavior as middle-class or uh, wealthier children. In fact, it was just the opposite. For children living in poverty, the higher the tone, the quicker they decided to take that single treat. Mm -hmm. So from a normative model of psychology, this result makes no sense. But when we consider what would have been the most optimal behavior in a high-risk uh, environment, this makes complete sense. It's survival of the quickest, Sturge Apple explains. Uh, context means everything. When all is well and prosperous, uh, when all is well and prosperous, kids who are highly attuned to what's going around them can wait. But when things are scarce and unpredictable, basically hesitation uh, could leave you hungry because if you don't grab it, somebody else will. 
on the dinner table, and perhaps, and then you will have none. So yeah, we just did we did a story a few months ago where, gosh, I don't remember what kind of animal it was. I want to say it was a type of bird that was prone to obesity if they were hungry as babies. Huh. Right. I remember that. Mm -hmm. similar. Yeah, so you can see how your impulse control is gone if you're not sure if there will be stuff later. Yeah, well, it's not that your impulse control is even necessarily gone because it's not showing... In, what the study is revealing is that it's not an in, uh, impulsive sure. act. Yeah, it's, it's not impulsivity. It's the correct strategy from everything that they've seen in their environment. It's the right, uh, right move. For them, and it's the move that uh, because the, of the high tone, it's the move uh, the move that they didn't that they did deliberate that they did have a chance to sort of calmly think through and go, I better grab it now. But does that mean they don't trust the person that tells them that more marshmallows will come later? Uh, per, it could be it could be trust. Impulse. It could be partly, but the, again, this is this is if it's based on an experience of your history, it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, how much you trust the person necessarily, uh, but that it's you know, just general. You it's general that stress level. Change quick. Yeah. And that resources uh, when you when you have an opp the opportunity to eat dinner, you eat because if you don't, and your siblings have gotten there first, that was all that that was there for dinner, perhaps, right? As a for instance, I'm thinking of this dinner table where one they can keep bringing out more dishes if people are hungry, and one. That's the food on the table that if you can get to and eat, you're going to be well fed. But if, you're, uh, if your brother or your cousin eats all of the potatoes, you will have none. So I think this is an interesting thing where, you know, we, the two of you, like Brett Blair's wondering if it's impulsivity and you're saying it's not impulsivity. I wonder if this is uh, the kind of study that should make us really question what impulsivity really is. Why, why animals or people have, impu um, have impulse control issues? So maybe it is a higher general stress level or vagal tone. So if you do not have, you know, what they're calling uh, grace under fire, um, you're not going to be thinking about things so much. You're not going to be considering all the ramifications. What you're going to be thinking about is, you know, like Justin was saying, where your next meal is coming from, what you need to do now to survive, and what, you know, you're you're not thinking everything through because you don't have that time so, to so be again, able to do. I, so maybe I, impulsivity I gotta... is actually a good strategy in certain situations for survival. But I'm slightly disagreeing again with, with the, <laughs> because the high vagal tone was there with the wealthy kids who could delay mm. the longest. So I mean, it's, right? So I got, I got, I got that backwards then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so right. So the low vagal to, uh, tone it means you, you're not you're controlling. Not as adapted. Yeah. You're less. You're less. Uh, uh, less in, sort of in control of it. Uh, yeah. In a in a way. So. It's an interesting mix, but I think this is this is sort of related to other studies that we we've seen that have been done about poverty, um, where poverty sort of limits long-term thinking. And it's not that it's creating impulsive behavior; it's that it's wired you to think in a a a get it done now, take care of today. Where's today's meal coming from? Where's this month's rent coming from? You're not thinking about a 401k when you retire if you're trying to get the scratch to to pay the the current rent that's due. So. Yeah, I, I was thinking about the the stereotype of the rich people being better at saving, <laughs> which is always true. Mm -hmm. You have less it's true. <laughs> good at saving, and it it maybe it's not a hundred percent just based on the fact that they have more money. Maybe it actually has to do with their ability to put things away. And no, it's a hundred percent based on the fact that they have more money, but they don't well, have to. Based on it, that, but there's something well, else going on there. I think that there is something to the fact that. Do you understand what I'm saying? That, it, that it, it's the same. It's the one marshmallow versus two marshmallows. It's mm -hmm. the can I put this away and wait for it to accrue some interest, or mm -hmm. can I spend this right now while I have it? Yeah. What should I do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What should any of us do? Well, it looks like we should fix our vagal tone. <laughs> Yeah, which is, that? I guess, what which I guess it's what the whole like meditation and stress reduction thing is about these days, right? Yeah. What if just adrenaline ruined uh, your body? But, but all the high vagal tones made the right decisions, though. 
It's I, some of it has to do with. I have to think it has to do with um, if it's related to stress. It has to do with how your body deals with certain chemical reactions that take place in your body when you're exposed to stress. Right. And I, I think about how some people get an adrenaline rush and then five minutes later they're fine, and some people get an adrenaline rush and they're shaking for an hour. And it's, you know, it's, I wonder, it sounds related to me. It really does. But again, that's another study, I suppose. I find adrenaline rushes very calming. <laughs> sure you do. Especially when jumping out of moving vehicles. Oh, why would you yeah. do such of a thing? I what? wouldn't. Is that I a transition? Know. Do you have a jumping out of vehicles story? You must. Is it no, I don't. But oh. you know what time it is? <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. <laughs> Biped, milliped, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? I have a really exciting invertebrate sex story, actually. Oh. Um, so this one is about burying beetles, which I want to tell you a little bit about burying beetles before I get into the story because not everyone might be familiar. I actually wasn't very familiar with burying beetles either. So I went to the St. Louis Zoo's website, quick plug for them, because they have some great animal fact pages and it turns out that they actually have American burying beetles at the St. Louis Zoo. So by looking this up I found out that they're called burying beetles because they bury their food, carrion, already dead animals, they bury it and then they use the carcass as feed for their babies. So can you say can you say berry again? D what I say, <laughs> honey? I, oh, did I say bury? You said bury. Bury. Yeah, that's how I say berry. I don't know where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what kind of accent that is, but that's how I say that word. So anyway, <laughs> burying beetles. Oh, what am I supposed to say? Burying beetles? Oh my gosh. Okay, so yeah. they, they bury the carrion, and it's usually stuff like mice, voles, opossums, birds, snakes, fish, pretty much anything they can find. And then they lay their eggs near the carcass that they buried underground. And then within four days, the eggs hatch, and then the parents move the larva to the carcass. The larva then asks to be fed, I love this, by stroking the parents' mandibles. <laughs> that adorable. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> that's one way to do it. Yeah. So Mommy. then both parents feed their offspring by eating some of the dead, rotting flesh, then regurgitate it into the larva's mouths. That goes for about six to twelve days until the larvae begin their next stage of development, pupation. Okay, and then after about forty-eight to sixty days, the adults emerge, and then the circle of life begins again. But all this starts with copulation, and these guys have males and females going through very intense coevolution. And the study from the University of Exeter that I want to talk about this week is actually all about that coevolution. I've talked a lot on the show about coevolution of species. And that's where, for example, a predator prey or a parasite and host will evolve alongside each other in this arms race over the generations, right? And so through that process, the prey gets better at evading the predator. The predator gets new moves to kind of catch the prey. This is a case of coevolution between male and female. And that's because the males want to copulate with the females more than the females need. These females don't need multiple multiple pairings to get enough sperm. They can get all the sperm they need from one encounter. So they don't want more mating because that will actually weaken them 
They won't be able to have as many babies, feed the babies as well, any of these other things. And so the males and females are actually in their own coevolutionary arms race. And the way that the, the scientists at University of Exeter figured this out was by actually imposing their own selective pressure on these males and females by pairing off these individuals based on how based on, on family lines that either really liked to copulate or didn't like to copulate as much. So the ones that sought sex often got put together, the males got put together in with different females, and then they saw what happened. And in just 10 generations, this is like an evolutionary blink of the eye, in 10 generations, the males evolved longer copulatory organs, and the females evolved larger claws on their genitalia. Wow. Genital claws? That's correct. <laughs> That's one way to stop them from coming, right? That's right. Oh, my goodness. So... This is fascinating for a few reasons. The main one is that in only 10 generations, huge morphological differences arose strictly based on males really wanting to have multiple copulation events and females not wanting any of it. Right. 10 generations. That's fast. But yeah. it is, I mean... This is something that's like a it's a it's a phenotypic change. This is something that um, the genes are already there, and so this is a this is an adaptation that is is being directly selected for because they're putting sp specific individuals together for mating purposes. Um, you know, so the it's not like this is uh, um, something that's just arriving de novo. It's not like a brand new trait. It's just an accentuation of the traits that were all were already there because they were placed under specific selection pressures. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. did happen fast. It but. happened very fast, but you're exactly right. It was a direct relationship. So the mm -hmm. females that had more more cl bigger claws on their genitalia, the males went off after less. They didn't make as much trouble with them. The females were able to have more healthy babies. The males that had longer, thinner copulatory organs were able to copulate more and therefore have more babies. There's a direct relationship there. There's not multiple steps. So it was pretty easy to get from one to the other. So yeah, yeah. I do cool. love this, though, in that just a, probably a couple of years, they were able to figure this out and see evolution in real time. Yeah. That, that's a very fascinating story, but um, just just a quick note, uh, I'll explain in the after show, but we may need to make an edit to this segment. I, I think I heard it. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, the next one that I have is a, a quick invertebrate sex story based on something we've talked about before, and that is male spiders giving nuptial gifts to females. And presents! Yes, presents. Food wrapped in silk for the female. And the University of Denmark was looking to see why the males of nursery web spiders would do this. It, basically, there's a few different options as to why they might be doing it. It might be to woo the female. It might be to show a degree of parental investment or fitness. Or it might be a shield against cannibalism. So their quick and easy experiment was 280 pairs of spiders. They ran them through a variety of tests. They Males were caused to appear before a female. Some of them were able to make gifts, and some of them were caused to appear before a female with no gift. <laughs> they took their presence away, basically, kind of, didn't they? <laughs> them slapping the, the, the package out of their hands. <laughs> no, you you can't do this. Uh. Uh, but it sounds like really there just weren't materials for them to make it. Oh no. I worked so, really hard on that. From males that showed up without a gift, they were eaten 15% of the time by the females. Males that showed up with a gift 
We're only eating 3.6% of the oh, time. Oh, much better odds. And it didn't matter how hungry the female was. So if it had to do with how hungry the female was, it would be more related to courtship or fitness or any of these other things. But this is actually, it has nothing to do with that. It's all about distraction. And actually, the only male that, sh that was eaten that showed up with a gift, it was after they had already copulated. So they were not only not eaten as often, they were allowed to copulate, they were given more access, and they were granted longer access for copulation. So still, I would say it's still not clear based on this study exactly what, what use the gift is, but overall it reduced cannibalism, it reduced uh, their... Well, well, that's just it. That's just it. I mean, if that's that's the use right there. Here. It increased their ability to mate. It was longer, yeah. and they were allowed access. So it was a win-win-win. <laughs> so it sounds like, really, it it's to keep her from eating them. It sounds like that's the main reason. But I'd say there still need to be more studies. Yeah. No, no. Before we go, before we leave the restaurant... You know what? Let's let's have dessert. No, 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 no. Let's go ahead. It's on me. We're having dessert. We're having dessert too. Yeah. Bring us a pie. Like a whole pie. Just bring the <laughs> as much as you want. Yeah. Yeah, so spider sex is complicated, guys. Um the last story I have in the animal corner tonight is about dolphins and their ability to make wide variety of interesting sounds. Um, so I'm sure we're all familiar with the sounds that dolphins make. There are clicks, there are screeches, there are, there's kind of a low thumping sound. These can be made separately or at the same time. And scientists have been trying to figure out how they do this for a long time because they don't have vocal cords like we do. And, and then also, you know, even if they did, how, I mean, how do they project it and like, how do, how do they project these sounds through the water? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so Aaron Thode, a research scientist at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego, he wanted to make a model that could replicate these sounds. And he was able to do it by looking through a model that was made for the human voice, where they found it, it was lumped it was a lumped element model for vocal cords, and they had them as discrete masses connected by strings, so those would store and release energy, and then he had dampers, which dissipates the energy. So it worked pretty much exactly like vocal cords and could replicate a lot of the sounds that vocal cords can make. So he worked with his father, Lester Thode, who's a physicist from Los Alamos National Laboratory, to make a model for dolphin nasal passages, which is where the current wisdom is as to where it's coming from, is the nasal passage just below the blowhole. So what they did is they tried to recreate this cavity in between the blowhole and the nose that has these bursae, which are kind of like giant globs that they think thump against each other to make the initial loud thump. And then there's this extended ring. And the ring is thought to be when the, those bursae are pulled apart and then the lingering vibrations make the ring. But the thing oh. that they couldn't figure out was the loudest, highest frequency part of the call, which came from the bursae sticking slightly together before separating, kind of like silly putty. And so the only way they could figure out to have this kind of sticky situation where you pull it apart, it resists, and then it snaps, was with mucus. Oh, oh so they've got like an ongoing sinus infection that's helpful. Right. <laughs> so this mucus could create whistles, clicks, and click trains, as well as this ring. All of that could come, it, it kind of all came together when they used this mucusy material. Um, so the the thing that they want to the thodes want to mention is that just because one model works doesn't mean that's the right model 
necessarily. There could be another model that also works to make dolphin sound. So that's a good kind of disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. But it still sounds pretty good because we know that the dorsal bursae exist. We know that its location is around there. It's in the nasal passage, so it could have mucus in it. Sure, why not? Sounds good to me. <laughs> but there you go. That's very cool. Speech. I love. And I also love the father and son scientist team. That's that's yeah. pretty cool. But I also then also kind of in the back of my mind, there's a suspicion, like when you go to the junior high school science fair, and there's one that's like got like uh, you know a little bit too much sophistication to it. You're like, if you really do that, oh, your dad's a scientist. Okay, maybe you got a little help on the project. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, maybe, but remember, the main researcher works at the Scripps Institute, and the dad is a physicist. Yes. But this is a great pairing for this. You have the biologist and the physicist. That's Working cool. together, yeah. Exactly. There you go. Because maybe the biologist wouldn't necessarily get all the physics right, like all of the different forces that would be involved from the different membranes and the different um, uh, sacks of air, and in this case the um, they, mucus they both, yeah they both sound pretty brilliant but um, but I do like I do like the idea of all these charming uh, communications sort of and it, I guess uh, you know I can I can somehow visualize it in this abstract fake nasal cavity of a dolphin that I have constructed in my head right now of, of it sort of like running uh, running sound and vibration through these these nasal cavities, and it's like, ah, why, why isn't the flipper talking that much today? I don't have a cold. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have enough of a cold. All the funny sounds that you can make when you're mucusy. Yeah. You, if you have just the right amount of snot in your nose, you start to whistle through your nose. You can <laughs> kind of, you pull a deep breath in. You have kind of a low vibration that can come out if you're... And, and listening to Justin's voice today and my own, you know, yeah. there's also mucus on the membranes themselves that air passes through that can change the tonality of your voice. Absolutely. Based on, you know, how, how wide the passages are, how um, much mucus is on the membranes themselves. Yeah. And, and mucus... I've has all sorts of functions in the animal kingdom that don't always have to be about trapping particles. There's all sorts of functions. We've interviewed people talking about mucus before. So there, many functions for mucus in the animal kingdom. There's a little kingdom. too much function in me. I, between, <laughs> between last week's show and this week's show, I have, I have let loose of about a dolphin's worth of phlegm, and it's gen mucus. A it's worth? Is that the a, new metric? A, for, <laughs> that's the new metric. A dolphin's worth. A worth of mucus in there. And, uh, mucus. Hey, we're doing pretty good for uh, uh, first half of the show. Uh, it being towel day and all, we've we've got dolphins. That's right. Uh, we've got uh, we had mice. Uh, uh, I wonder if there's going to be some talk of fish later. That might uh, complete the cycle. Anyways, um, are, are we are only we if you have a story about fish? fish? Yeah, uh, we're I, done I, with I'll, the first half of the, the show. I'll mention the fish. <laughs> We don't need to unless there's a story. But for those of you who are looking forward to the second half of the show, we have cockroaches coming up and finches, birds, crocodiles, all sorts of fun things. So I hope you do stick with us for just a few more moments because we are going to take a very short break. This is This Week in Science. Hey everybody, if you listen to or watch Twists on a regular basis, we thank you for doing that. Thank you so much for joining us week after week after week. We hope that you keep coming back. And we also hope that you might enjoy wearing our logo on some of your stuff. You know, your coffee mug in the morning, a t-shirt, a tote bag that you take to the store. 
why don't you check out our Zazzle store. If you go to twist.org and look for our Zazzle store in the main header bar, you can find all sorts of products that have the Twist logo emblazoned all over it, so you can proclaim your enjoyment and love of Twist without really proclaiming it. You know, you don't have to go into the local square and shout that you love Twist. You can just wear a t-shirt or have a tote bag. And When you purchase these items, it does help us out financially to keep the show going, and it also makes everybody happy. So check it out, twist.org, zazzle.com. We've got a little, we've got a little link in our main header bar. Additionally, we are supported by listeners just like you, and your donations support everything that we do from our hosting, our bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, fun things we try to do for the show, all sorts of things and stuff, equipment, when we need new equipment. That is the big help. We appreciate any amount that you're able to give, whether it's $2, $20, whatever it is, Every single dollar helps keep this show running, and we really appreciate your help. We currently accept donations a couple of ways. One is through PayPal, and we have buttons all over our website, twist.org. You can go to, go to twist.org, click on the PayPal buttons, and that will allow you to easily donate through the PayPal interface. Additionally, we have started a Patreon account. We've had that going for a while now, and people seem to enjoy it, patreon.com slash This Week in Science. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash This Week in Science to be able to donate on a week-to-week basis to keep the show going at whatever level of support you're comfortable doing, whether it's a $1 donation per show or more. If you donate at, what is it, Blair, the $15 donation level, you can get Blair's hand-drawn art delivered to you. It's yeah, amazing. 15. The fif- 15, right? Yes. Anyway. Yeah. All right. So patreon.com or you can go to twist.org and look for the PayPal buttons, whichever your preference. We really appreciate your support if you can if you're able to give it. If you're not able to give it, we can always use your help to get more people listening to and watching Twist. Do you know we are just over 9400 subscribers on YouTube right now? That's little less than 600 subscribers will get us to 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, which will open up a whole level of using the LA YouTube studio to do sh- to do videos if we want to. There's all sorts of stuff that kind of happens when you hit 10,000, and it would be amazing to be able to hit 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. So can you subscribe to us on YouTube? That would help a lot. Also, can you get your friends to subscribe to us on YouTube? It would really help us a lot. Let's hit 10,000 subscribers. That's what we really want to do right now. Help us get there. Help us make that happen. Tell your, Do it yourself. Subscribe on YouTube and tell five friends. I bet that'll make it happen in less than a week. Let's do it. Let's do it. Come on. Anyway, no matter how you help us out, we thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. And we are back with more this week in science. Oh yeah, we are. Justin, do you have a story? I do. Uh, it involves scorpions, snakes, snails, spiders, frogs, lizards, jellyfish, non-jellied fish. Ah, we have fish. Even an <laughs> octopus. There's even an octopus involved. So many creatures on this planet produce venoms. Um. Uh. And uh, there are millions of distinct venoms out there. In fact, uh, possibly hundreds of millions, even. These venoms have been honed to strike specific targets in the bodies of their victims. And uh, for a uh, venomous uh, regular victim, this is, of course, a terrible thing. But for scientists, the the potent molecules and venoms hold the potential to be adapted into powerful targeted medicines. But venoms are difficult to isolate and analyze. However, uh, venoms are difficult to isolate and analyze using traditional methods. So only a handful of them are actually today being used as drugs. Now, a team led by scientists at the Scripps Research Institute 
has invented a method for rapidly identifying venoms that strike specific targets in the body and optimizing these venoms uh, for therapeutic use in delivering drugs to specific targets. The researchers demonstrated this new method by using it to identify venoms that block a certain protein on T cells. Uh, this protein is, of course, implicated in multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory uh, disorders. It's um, sort of synonymous with uh, HIV. The researchers then used their methods to find an optimized, long-acting variant of a venom that blocks the protein and showed that the new mo molecule powerfully reduces inflammation in mice. So the, to use venoms of, uh, as therapies, uh, it seems sort of like, oh gosh, we're using a poison as a cure. These are things that evolved over millions of years to cause some sort of harm to an organism. But low dose delivered to the right place can have very beneficial effects. There's, uh, they re reference a pain-killing drug I've never heard of, uh, Zeconatide. It's derived from one of the venoms used by cone snails uh, to mobilize fishy prey. But if you can immobilize a specific region that's causing pain, I guess, or pain receptors, boom, there you go. You've got a fantastic pain-killing drug. Uh, venoms are also attractive from a drug development mm -hmm. perspective. Oh, go ahead. I was, just, I was just thinking about the cone snail venom and the, the compounds in that. I mean, researchers have been looking at that for years yeah. for, for harnessing, to creating a, a medication to stop pain. Yeah, and there's there's one there's one out there. There's yeah. one out there that they've developed from it. Uh, mm -hmm. They say the, the venoms are also uh, very attractive just for 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 drug delivery in general because they they hit their targets on cells with very high potency and with and more importantly high selectivity, right? So these are these uh, venoms work on specific body parts and regions. Like something's gonna slow a heart or immobilize. Uh, you know, a, a physical ability to move or numb uh, the object so it doesn't perhaps feel that it's being eaten. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't react negatively right. to this yeah. event. So, but uh, but there aren't that many therapies out there actually because it's uh, the traditional method is to collect lots and lots and lots of venom and sort of trial and error, figure out how it works, where it's working, in a very sort of mundane way. The new method uh, is geared for speed and involves the extraction of information with little direct involvement from the venomous creatures. So to start, uh, senior scientists of the uh, Lerner Laboratory, uh, Hong Kai Zhang, Zhang uh, con consulted animal toxin databases and assembled a list of 589 venoms whose protein sequences uh, have features of interest. They then synthesized the venoms genes and inserted them into special viruses to deliver genes into cells. The aim of the initial proof of principle was to find venoms that block a potassium ion channel protein known as KV1.3. Uh, ion channels uh, allow charged molecules to flow in and out of cells. They're involved in a variety of biological functions, therefore. Uh, and, it makes, and they are a common target of venoms. The uh, K13 uh, is of special interest to the pharmaceutical industry because it appears to facilitate the proliferation and migration of T cells that drive inflammatory disorders. So uh, to, to screen their library of venoms for those that block the KV-13, the researchers, uh, uh, they uh, used cell-based selection system of a type developed by Zhang. They created a culture of spe uh, special KV-13 Three containing test cells, which uh, had a strong interaction between venom and the ion channel. So uh, they really they started not with the whole trial and error, and not with just sort of knowing how specific venoms had attacked certain body uh, parts, but with the with the data set of uh, and, and 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 working based on that to create their own sort of synthetic delivery uh, uh, of this venom. And, and it's been, thus far, successful. So this may be, as we've seen, you know, uh, different, different takes on creating 
uh, vaccines, which accelerate the ability for us to make vaccines, as we've seen things like CRISPR has done to accelerate gene manipulation. This technique may be accelerating. It's not its own research into creating a specific drug, but maybe the accelerating tool uh, that scientists can now use to use venom or uh, the, uh, the makeup of a venom to target drugs more effectively. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, if we, and anything that we can, that we can do, that we can use to make that drug development pipeline move a little bit faster and more smoothly, you know, get rid of the bad ones faster, tone in on the ones that are really going to work. I mean, that's, that's going to make, make it all so much more efficient and then hopefully get treatments to people faster, yeah. cheaper, better, right? Right. And, and a side piece of this, uh, I'd never heard of a highly venomous octopus before. Oh, yeah. There are definitely venomous octopuses. Uh, apparently one of the most venomous creatures on the planet. There's something called a blue-ringed octopus. It's about the size of a golf ball, uh, but its venom can kill a human. Not only that, it, it, has, it carries enough venom to kill uh, about 30 adult humans. And there is Ouch. no antidote. And there is no antidote. And it kills them within minutes. Like, they don't even... It's like, oh, what was that I stepped on? I don't know. Let's keep swimming. Then gone, right? Um, and don't it's found in the Pacific yeah, Ocean, good. which is the ocean... Uh, what, did, what did Blair say? What? Don't go in the ocean. Don't, don't go in the go ocean. In the ocean. <laughs> no, what I was thinking was that the more drugs and medicines that we can we can create from natural starting points, then that also causes less problems when that gets flushed into waterways, potentially. I think about a lot of the more um, synthetic things that we end that we end up throwing into into our waterways and other places that start interacting with things in a way we don't expect and things that are that have a more natural starting point like venoms potentially not a hundred percent of the time but potentially could cause less problems like that as well potentially uh, but meh, they're they're honing in on very focused aspects of them you know it has to do with quantity you know what's the concentration that's entering the water that's what's going to have if you're using a highly potent venom you probably only need a very small amount <laughs> Yeah, strength, strength in the chat room is pointing out that they have the uh, blue ringed uh, octopus in Australia. Uh, ben Rothig in the chat room points out everything in Australia tries to kill you. It's true. It's true. Um, let's see. So moving on from octopuses to clouds. Clouds mm -hmm. are awesome. We love clouds. We love looking at clouds in the sky. Well. Um, clouds are also very, very involved in the greenhouse effect. So water vapor, when it gets into the sky, it condenses, forms clouds. Clouds can form a layer that block the sun's rays from hitting the planet, thus actually cooling the planet, even though the greenhouse effect overall leads to a buildup of heat underneath that blanket layer, right? So we've got the blanket that covers the planet and insulates it, but we've also got a reflective layer of clouds that can reflect light away and keep the heating from happening too quickly. So we thought, or researchers have actually been debating this, but there's, there's this idea that sulfuric acid is highly, highly important for the formation of clouds. What started putting lots of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere? We did, our industry. Oh, right. oh us. Right. Us. That would be us. So um, there's been this idea that pre industrial skies had uh, fewer clouds. And so maybe there was a a different kind of warming going on. Um, and so now we've been formed, and, and the idea was that pre, uh, after the Industrial Re Revolution, we've been forming more and more clouds, and so we're potentially changing the way, the rate at which warming is going to take place um, because of the clouds that, uh, that industry have put into the air. Well, 
two big studies came out this week in uh, Nature. One of them is kind of a theoretical study that's looking at stuff um, in the lab, in the lab, simulating atmospheric conditions. And this is the Cosmics Leaving Outdoor Droplets project in a controlled chamber at CERN. It's the cloud project. And they are basically shooting cosmic rays at different gases in a controlled chamber to see what happens. They put a bunch of stuff that they thought was like, oh, this is, this is stuff that comes from trees. It's like natural vapors from trees, and let's see what happens with that. Oh, they had cloud formation. And they also did it with sulfuric acid. Oh, same kind of cloud formation. So really, the stuff getting put into the atmosphere, there are certain little nuggets, little particles that end up there that create the little, little bits of stuff that lead to the formation of clouds. There's like there have to be little particles that seed the cloud formation. And yes, sulfuric acid works, but also these vapors released from clouds. And in the second study, a, which took place at a high altitude research station called the Jungfrau Jok High Altitude Research Station, it's 3,500 meters in the sweet Swiss Alps. And um, they actually saw that this process occurs in nature. They observed formation of organic particles without any sulfuric acid being involved. Um, they measured the changing concentrations of sulfuric acid and organic molecules in the air. And they found with, really that more aerosols formed with more organic mo molecules around. So we don't necessarily need industry to form clouds. And so now this is kind of, these two studies are kind of throwing a little hubbub into uh, the climate change uh, climate models because clouds really have been one of the areas of debate of uncertainty as to how they really affect heating or cooling and what is the source of those things. And so there have been certain assumptions made that before we started in our industrial era, there were fewer clouds, heating was happening in a, nat a different way than it is now. But now the question is, oh, maybe ancient skies were much more similar to the way they are currently, so maybe we need to, need to go back and look at our models again. And now I just want to make one major point that this does not negate anything about climate change. All it does is bring up this this little aspect of the models that will basically determine whether or not whether or not the ultimate like high high temperatures that are um, that are estimated from the IPCC whether those will be reached and so I mean it's kind of cool if maybe they might not be reached that would be great it would be nice if the cloud formation that we have currently, that we have enough organic, that we might have enough organic molecules to be able to cool the planet a little bit more than we had thought. So who knows? That's it's a, the value of trees too, right? I mean, and yes, and then thus the value of trees, yes. It's another thing that plants do for us that help to mm -hmm. mitigate the, the, the warming, right? Yeah. But if we could find an artificial way uh, to manufacture this and seed our atmosphere with it. Um, we could maybe stimulate the cloud formation that we would need to help keep cooling. I, I think we're going, we're going to have to do some terraforming and engineering here. I know. It's scary. It's scary, but um, we've already been doing it the other Locked direction for so long. So. Like, what? But the tricks. Say it again? Are you suggesting we black out the sun, like in the Matrix? <laughs> right. Uh, I'm not saying, um, I'm not quite saying that, but um, maybe a little bit. I mean, it might come down to it, right? I I, yeah, I think, I think if we, I think the big thing is, though, if we are going to do anything like seeding the skies for creating clouds, I mean, this kind of study, understanding how and why clouds form in the first place, what kind of an effect they have on the greenhouse effect, you know, what is their real role in the entire system? 
that's what we need to work on understanding before we go messing around with it because then it's just like oh hey we're just still running this giant global experiment that we've been running you know I think we should figure things out a bit more before we actually start doing those things but anyway Yes, but see, you also uh, have this as a, I I am I'm the low impulse control or the uh, assume that my <laughs> my my survival strategy is all about taking care of stuff today. So um, we'll see how it plays out. We'll see because this is the, the political will of the nation will be faced with this marshmallow test at some point, whether we take That's a marshmallow right. now or wait for more marshmallows to just show up later. We've been taking marshmallows. We <laughs> have. <laughs> We've already downed a few of them, haven't we? Yeah, tell me a quick Egyptian marshmallow oh, gosh, story. Quick, but I'll do it fast. Uh, it's a bioarchaeological evidence uh, showing Nubians and Egyptians integrated into a single community. So this is a, an Egyptian colonized area in 1500 BC. Uh, they 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 went. They wanted trade routes for the Nile River. Uh, it was down in Sudan, I guess, and it was known as the New Kingdom Empire. Uh, typically, I guess researchers would assume that the local local uh, Sudanese or Nubians had sort of just taken on Egyptian culture as it was so dominant at the time. However, they've uh, found some some tombos or tombs basically in the Nile River Valley, the Nubian Desert, in the far north of Sudan, and that date to about. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I guess it's from 1400 to 1000 BC, e, BCE, whatever BC. Uh, this is when the Egyptians sort of were losing power and the Nubians sort of rose in power and defeated the Egyptians in the 25th dynasty. But all this is beside the point. What they found was an interesting mix of cultural burial. So I guess then in Egyptians, they would sort of be. Uh, placed in a coffin and laid out straight, whereas Nubians, they would put them on this wooden board and sort of have them on their side. What they found in the burials was interesting mixes of the bunch. Um, they would still have the wooden boards that the Nubians would normally be buried on, but it would be in the coffin, but they would be pretty much outstretched, but maybe not always. And it was this sort of... And they also found uh, morphological evidence, perhaps, and, and skulls and the rest that, that made it look like there was interbreeding and marriages going on. So uh, the Egyptian methods of conquering uh, back in the, the 1500 BC range looked like sort of integration. You know, uh, yes, we're the dominant culture we've taken over, um, but, you know, we're, we'll, we'll share your culture uh, with you. Uh, even into the death. That's interesting. Yeah, that's uh, there are. That's not the only culture to have done that. The Mongols also kind of uh, the, the Mongol Romans. I mean, not the not the Mongols. The Mongols actually just took over. The Romans did this kind of bringing in different people's cultures and allowing them to kind of yeah. meld into the whole. Um, and actually the Mongolians that were, were actually were, were, were pretty good at this. So one of the things the Mongolians would do, and this is uh, this is one of the things I love about Genghis, or however you want to say Genghis Khan, Genghis, uh, is that he would give this ultimatum of, you know, uh, resistance is futile, uh, join us without a fight, or we're going to raise your city to the ground. And, and if they decided to comply, they kept their religion, they kept their culture, and they were just under a sort of tra uh, trade mandate uh, through, for the Mongolian Empire. But if they didn't, it was like nobody lived. Right. Uh, but they were more than what the Mongol... Uh, Genghis, 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 however you say it, uh, was more than willing to allow everybody to keep religion and culture intact as long as they went along and, and joined you just gotta go uh, along. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, go along to get along. There seems to be like a kind of you know for cultures to survive, you know that this is a this is a strategy that works. Yeah, and this is and this yeah. is an interesting story too, and just in that there hasn't been very much uh, evidence of what this this uh, integration was. Yeah. This, so they didn't have they don't have a whole lot of archaeological data. So this is the first piece that, uh, in these tombs that were discovered. Uh, they've been working on on them since about 2000, uh, and uh, yeah, it looks like uh, 
looks like it was uh, sort of like how the Romans took care of business, you know? We'll send our people down there to go live amongst you, and we'll, you know, imply our trade is the, is the way to go. But uh, there was marriages and cultural merging taking place. Nice. Um, speaking of mergings taking place, how about magnetism? Magnetism. We've been talking about mm -hmm. magnetism in the animal kingdom for some time. This whole idea that uh, some uh, many birds are able to sense magnetic fields. Fruit flies recently, Blair reported on. Uh, fruit flies with the cryptochrome 1 protein that allows them to, this is a light sensing, a photosensitive protein that also allows these little flies to sense magnetic fields um, that we think it might also be uh, in, in birds and other animals. Well, guess what animal they looked at recently? The cockroach, because why ah. not the cockroach if you're going to... Of course, because I always think of magnets and cockroaches. That's why they're I mean, always hanging out under the bridge. Anyway, they went looking and um, they tested cockroaches for a cryptochrome, a related cryptochrome protein called cryptochrome two. So not cryptochrome one because they don't have that protein, but they have a they found they have a related one. So they went looking at the genes that the cockroaches had, and then they found by turning this gene off or turning it on, they were able to affect the magnetic sensitivity of the cockroaches. So when the cockroaches were put in a magnetic field, it actually changed the behavior of the cockroaches depending on whether or not they had this gene. And so um, it they also were able to change the sensing of the magnetic field by painting the cockroaches' eyes black so that they couldn't see anything. So it is also a light-sensitive protein. Now this protein is um, kind of far down the stream, so they don't want to jump at, at, at this protein as being the protein that is determines the magnetic uh, sensitivity and, the, and the, is, that is the mechanism, but it's definitely part of the chain somewhere, and uh, they think that these crypto, cryptochrome proteins are probably um, evolved in all sorts of organisms, uh, insects and, and others, so... Cryptochromes, photosensitive, and also magnetosensing. Hmm. Yeah, cockroaches. I never thought about that one. Well, anyway, um, tell me about zebra finches, Blair. Oh, well, zebra finches, they, their sexual selection is directly related to their ability as males to make fancy red beaks. And their fancy red beaks come from the carotenoids that they ingest from their diet of seeds, insects, stuff like that. But that mm -hmm. should come out yellow. It turns red through something internal, and researchers weren't sure yet about that. Um, and so the Cambridge Department of Zoology found that there were specific genes belonging to a wider family of genes that also play an important role in detoxification that we're getting this done. So that is one of the situations where you actually see sexual selection being a direct implication of fitness. So Yeah, if, and we talk about like red cheeks or red beaks or in birds and other animals as being these badges right. of health, right? Yeah, and sometimes the badge is a result of health, but in this case, it's not related to a healthy finch. A red-beaked finch isn't a healthy finch because being healthy allows you to grow a red beak. They have a red beak because the genes that code for turning pigments red in their beak are located on the same place where these detoxification genes are. That's cool. That's neat. Yeah. I love it. I and love it, yeah. I know that zebra finches, their, their red beak, it definitely is more or less red and that it is something that the girls, the ladies, looks, look for. And they're not the only birds that this happens at, and, and um, We've got uh, gross beaks and also uh, crossbills where their coloration definitely changes because of those carotenoids that they eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And the same genes that were involved in making the red are also involved in seeing red color. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. So, so maybe the healthier females are more able to detect males with redder beaks? Yeah. That sounds like your next experiment, Kiki. Right? <laughs> Let's look at that in the zebra fish world. Get the fidges! I'm out of retirement! I'm out, I'm out. Um, I have one more story before I'm totally out, and it's um, an ink. Your quickies. Oh, you do? Okay, we got to get through the quickies yeah. real quick. Mm -hmm. um, end of story, end of the, my, my last story has to do with cows, antibiotics, and dung beetles. Well, we know that cattle are treated with antibiotics, and it's a big question as to how that affects the health of the cattle and also how that affects the evolution of the bacteria that are potentially affecting the health of the cattle and then also potentially affecting the health of humans and then also how well those antibiotics are going to be working down the line, right? How effective they're going to remain. Big questions about this. But some researchers also thought, well, what is going on, you know, like Blair, you brought up the idea of like, well, we're when you take stuff like birth control pills or any medication, it ends up in the waterway, right? So when cattle who are given antibiotics go to the bathroom and drop their dung in a field, that dung is going to have some residual antibiotic a presence, a certain mm -hmm. concentration in it. So how is the antibiotic concentration in the dung from the cattle that are traversing the fields and, and farms uh, affecting the wildlife within mm -hmm. those areas? So not just cattle themselves, but the, the environment, yeah. the soil. And so they specifically analyzed this downstream effect of a cattle that were treated with a broad-spectrum antibiotic, uh, tetracycline, and um, they looked additionally at how much methane was, re was released from the dung of the animals. They found that uh, the, since the antibiotics affect the bacterial population in the dung, the dung actually releases more methane than if the cattle were not treated with antibiotics. So they believe, this is a quote from uh, the co-author Tobin Hammer from uh, University of Colorado Boulder who told New Scientist, we believe that the tetracycline treatment favors the growth of methanogenic archaea in the cow's intestinal tract by reducing the bacteria in the gut. So like meth methanogenic Archae, archae, archaea bacteria. These are ones that produce methane, more methane. So, antibiotics. We now have to check how they are lining up with uh, the methane that cattle are putting into the environment from their dung. And then, additionally, they were able to see that it did also affect the um, the micro my, microbial populations of dung beetles who feed on the dung. So they don't know what effect it has on the health of the, the dung beetles, but they did find that the populations that, of bacteria that live on and in the dung beetles are also affected because the beetles are basically living on and in and feeding on this dung. So anyway, downstream effects. We should be looking at them. Mm-hmm. Uh, based on uh, universal scaling laws applied to large data sets, uh, appearing in Journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Indiana University of Bloomington researchers have uh, pronounced that the Earth could contain nearly one trillion species of uh, life forms, uh, most of those being microbes. Uh, that haven't been identified, but they, they go further to say that 99.999% of all species remain undiscovered. Again, that's pretty much all microbes, but still. Microbes, uh, yeah. Yeah. Prenatal fruit consumption boosts babies' cognitive development. But how in the world does a prenatal baby eat fruit? Ancient DNA suggests Phoenician from Carthage 2,500 years ago uh, had a ancestry from a very rare genotype in Europe. So, uh, you know, people got around and traveled. Astronomers confirm faintest early universe galaxy ever seen. Uh, but it was 13 billion years ago, so that's pretty old news. And, and gut flora may lead to better diagnosis tool for liver disease uh, and open avenues for treatment. So this is 
if you have that uh, uh, scurliosising, pangolitising, I'm not even sure how to say those words. But if your liver's bad, you got the toxic liver thing going on, uh, actually your gut microflora, they find, uh, for people who have PSC, there's a sort of trend within their microflora that they all sort of move towards when they have this disease. And so this, they think, they can create a profile for your microflora, which if it makes this sort of move in this direction, may indicate early diagnosis, indicate that it's time to check your liver. Very good. And Blair, your quick croc story? Yeah. Um, next time you're in Florida, stay away from the crocodiles and alligators, even more so than normal. The latest invasive species into Florida Nile crocodiles. Nile crocodiles are responsible for at least 480 attacks on people a year in Africa and 123 fatalities between 2010 and 2014. These guys get up to 18 feet long <laughs> and they can get as big as a car. So, um, yeah, Florida, stop releasing pets into the wild. <laughs> Yeah, releasing pets into the wild is bad, okay? But you know what's great? Our Patreon sponsors. Yay, Patreon. I would like, like to take this moment to say thank you to all of our Patreon sponsors. Yay, including, here goes the list. Paul Disney, Kevin Parachan, Keith Corsell, Steve DeBell, Melissa Mosley, Jesse Moreno, Patrick O'Keefe, Jason Schneiderman, Rudy Garcia, Gerald Sorrells, Greg Guthman, Alex Wilson, David Neighbord, Jason Dozier, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Patrick Cohn, Chris Clark, Richard Onimus, John Ratnaswamy, Byron Lee, E.O., Jared Lysette, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, Jake Jones, Mark Massaros, Trainer84, Advartis Rimkus, Brian Hedrick, Cassie Lester, Sarah Chavis, Layla, Bob Calder, Shane and Tara Ginsburg, Marshall Clark, Darlene, Ka <laughs> Charlene Henry, Don Kamarechka, Larry Garcia, Randy Mazuka, Ed Dyer, Tony Steele, Dave Rydell, Craig Landon, Daryl Lambert, David Wiley, Robert Aston, Nathan Greco, Hexator, Deborah Smith, Mitch Neves, Flying Out, John Crocker, Richard Porter, Christopher Dreyer, Andrew Dolinger, Sylvan Westby, RTM, Pixel Fly, Shu Wada, Stephen B., Dave Wilkinson, Steve Mashinsky, Rodney Lewis, Braxton Howard, Phil Nadeau, Rick Ramos, Sal Good Sam, Matt Sutter, Emma Grenier, Philip Shane. James Dobson, Kurt Larson, Stefan Insom, Michael George, Russell Jensen, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Tara Payne, John Maloney, Jason Olds, James Noah Wiles, Paul West, Ali, Alec Doty, Iluma Lama, Joe Wheeler, Dougal Campbell, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkan, Aaron Luthan, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, David Simmerly, Tyler Harrison, Ben Rothig, Columbo Ahmed, and Gary Swinsburg. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. If you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at This Week in Science, or actually, no, you can find information at patreon.com slash This Week in Science. Also, remember that you can help us out simply by telling your friends about Twist and subscribing to us on YouTube. On next week's show, we'll be back once again, and it's World Oceans Day next week. This week it was Towel Day. Turtle Day. Next week, it's all about the oceans. We will be back again broadcasting live online, online at 8 p.m. Pacific time. Twist.org slash live is where you can watch and join our chat room, but don't worry if you can't make it. You can always catch past episodes at twist.org slash YouTube or just twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have an Android-type device, twist the number four Droid app in the Android Marketplace is where you can hear all of the This Week in science -y stuff. Also, This Week in Science, anywhere in the Apple Marketplace, even the Apple TV, which I have still yet to see. For more information on anything you've he heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts as well as other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter. We are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your 
feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes due in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. Yo. Boom. Oh. Ooh, it's feeding back. Feeding back. Feeding back. Back, 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 back. Is that the mix? I don't know. Um, I don't know. My lighting is terrible tonight. It's like I feel like I'm under in investigation. I'm like, what's going on? Um, so, Blair, what is it? All, all crocodile, all... All alligators are crocodiles, but not all crocodiles are gators. All no. All, um, all gators. All gators are crocs. Neither. No, neither. They're all crocodilians. Crocodilians, right? All gators are crocs. But crocodiles are different. So in the crocodilian family, there's crocodiles, alligators, caiman, gharials. Uh, but they're all crocodilians. 
Um, they're crocodilians, but they're not crocodiles. Ha <laughs> ha, it's confusing. But you could technically say it's kind of like the all... Uh... <laughs> so all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises, right? So mm -hmm. that tortoises are a subdivision of turtles. Right. But alligators are not a subdivision of crocodiles. They're crocodiles a are subdivision of the crocodilians. Right. So it's this weird thing where the word crocodilia is, sorry, I said family. It's an order. And inside that is, um, I'm trying to find, Wikipedia, you are failing me right now. Uh -huh. uh, I'm all bourbons to... are, are, all bourbons are whiskey. But not all whiskeys yeah. are bourbon. Totally. Here we go. Okay, so the right. crocodile so, is put into three or two, two. Here, let me screen share this. I understand what you're saying, but technically, crocodilian you could shorten to croc. Croc, but not crocodile. I didn't say crocodile. <laughs> you did say crocodile. Okay, so I, what I meant to say. <laughs> Is not all gators are crocs, but no, not all crocs are gators. Right. All yes. Right. Great. <laughs> Wait, couldn't we? Can't we just do the teeth are on the outside? It's a croc thing. <laughs> Isn't that how this works? So, um, and the way to remember that is that. See, I want to stop screen sharing so I can show you. Stop it. Stop it. Okay. Stop it. Stop a, it. a, a is for alligator. Hmm. Top teeth. A is for alligator. Top teeth only. Huh. Crocodiles make a zipper. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's how you figure it out, right? That's it. Leave it there. Leave it there. You uh, see bottom teeth sticking out, it's a it's a croc. Right. But um there there's also the fact that alligators are only freshwater, and there's only two species of alligators on the whole planet. And that's the American alligator, which is in Florida, and New Orleans and the Everglades. And then there's the Chinese alligator in oh, China. <laughs> then, <laughs> That's amazing. Crocodiles are salt water, brackish water, occasionally fresh water. Hmm. They generally are larger, but there's exceptions to that. They have the teeth going both ways. Then you have gharials, which are the weird... Um, they have like a really tight nose. Yeah, the long skin... Tinos. Yes, exactly. Bars. Yes, so they have gharials, and and then caimans are most. They just look kind of like tiny crocodiles. Yeah, they're cute. Um, and then there's a, this is a scientific term, crap ton of crocodiles. <laughs> okay. Um, speaking of scientific terms. Yeah, I know. Uh, I realized what I did. You know what you did, because I was, I was like, it came out of my mouth. I, I was, I was, I was so about to comment on it, and I was like, I didn't do it on purpose. A little bit in shock, I was like, oh, she doesn't know what she just said. I what did she know. say? It came out of my mouth. Oh, I talked about how the male. Was it the, when you said it keeps them from coming? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I heard. I heard I, that. I was. That was. And not maybe it's mind. just me, because no. both of you carried on just with like. I'm a professional. professionalism, and I'm like. No, you can tell. <laughs> I act you just you can't I stop. Just it's only going to be heard by anybody who's not the two of you locked in on the subject. <laughs> completely <laughs> differently. That was not intentional at all. Yeah. Oh. Hum. And then I was also like vaguely like. Maybe she did just mean that, and it's just no. like we're having an adult conversation, and I just didn't realize that I'm coming into this as though this was a family show, and we're just gonna roll, <laughs> roll out any you know adultish comments, just though like yeah, this is we're all adults here. Why wouldn't we talk like this? Like I had, I didn't know what to do. I was actually I had like a mental shutdown take place. I just couldn't talk. I'm like I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Just, I, I know. Sometimes when you're not scripted, they can't. it's a live show, people. It's a live show. Just remember, it's a live show. Just trying to see, say, C O M I N G. Um. Yeah. Yep. 
I get it. I get it. But, yep, <laughs> we get it. <laughs> we get it. But everybody else got something completely different. That's the, that's the thing. Oh, my goodness. Um, so I am staying at somebody's house, and they just got back, and so I feel I'm, I'm going to go hang out with them and have a glass of wine so that I can be like, thanks for letting me stay at your house. You're really awesome. Thanks for letting me use your Wi-Fi and do this show and ignore you in a closed room. Are you in for an hour and a half right now? What? Are you in the city? I am. <gasps> oh, you're so close. I'm so close. I can almost feel you. <sighs> Shh. Hello, okay, California. You have to at least say hello when you're there tomorrow. Oh, oh yeah, totally. Five seconds. Um, yeah. And if you need, um, if Jason can't meet you down in front, I can walk you to where he is if you need that. I can okay. Do that, so. Yeah, he gave me, sent me some map to get him, like, get to the back. I don't know. He's like, it's the back way to get to where I work. And I'm like, okay. VIP. VIP. Going to the zoo with the VIP. Getting places. No me. Yay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry when I rap every once in a while. It's terrible. I do it, and I'm sorry. From the <laughs> Big Bang to the latest advances, we got more science news than Chinese zoos got pandas. Nice. That's right. Very nice. Um, Dave, I think you should put that in Urban Dictionary. <laughs> Which? Blairism. Blairism. Accidental <laughs> porn statement. Accidental porn statement. Yeah. Or not so accidental spider porn. Yeah, it's not so. It's never accidental spider porn when it's when it comes to Blair. It's always on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like how uh, saying VIP Kiki reminded me that Justin kept putting your name when he used Kiki. He kept putting it in quotes. <laughs> what? Wait, what? Kiki. He's like, Kiki parentheses Kirsten. <laughs> I was like, Jason, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who is doing this? So apparently, this guy who's um, the head of the wellness and conservation like department at the zoo uh, is an we old. We were in grad school. Yeah, an, yeah, yeah. Old friend of mine. We traveled together. We we're in grad school. So the fellow co lab mates sent him a formal media request, and he saw Kiki's name in the body of my proposal below, and he was like, actually. I know who that is. <laughs> Kiki. <laughs> Kirsten. <laughs> Parentheses. <laughs> Kirsten. <laughs> He's amazing. That's awesome. Nice. That's awesome. Can't wait to see him. That's going to be great. Yeah. It's going to be great. Ugh. Oh, if you guys need a drinking game... May I recommend watching Eurovision 2016? And when they do, like, before every performer goes on, they do, like, this little, this country is amazing. And this per this performer and countries, and they don't tell you what country it is till the end of the little video collage that they do. And so it's really fun to try and figure out what country the different performers come from. And if you get it, you make everybody else drink. Oh, that's a uh, good, it's yeah. a very fun game. I that have one's to. A little, that one's got more subtlety than mine. My my drinking game is to watch Leaving Las Vegas and drink whenever they drink. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just ended up in the hospital. Yeah, and then <laughs> it's a it's a night ender. It's an and early then evening. You're done. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Vegas. I'm gonna. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to go. Yeah. You guys can hang out if you yeah. want. Um, uh, uh, Blair, if you could share the their strengths is put in, I guess, into the chat room, oh, okay. YouTube video, which is a promo jingle that mentions every deadly Aussie animal. I, I definitely think cool. we should play this. If um, you're watching, no. Well, I'm going to go. Yeah, yeah. You go. I'm not, not going to hit. Do you, do you guys have a stop broadcast button? Yeah, I've got two of them. Uh, one is closing the window. Have a stop broadcast button, Justin. Do you? 
Do you have one um, actually, that says stop broadcast? No, actually, I guess I don't. So we might go away. Um, yeah, we'll go away. I think it gives us a little bit of time before we go away, though. So we'll try. And if we yeah. pop out, good night, everybody. Um, yeah, good night, Kiki, minions. Thanks for hanging out. Passwords to the Zazzle store. I still I, need to do that because you know what? I forgot what it was. That was my. That's why I haven't gotten it to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Tony Steele sent me the. Original graphics from the um, oh nice Happy Trails where we're yeah. all stagecoach. So I can oh, that. cool! That nice too. Nice. He said he said we could do that. Yeah, he did. Oh, that's sweet of him. Okay. So nice of him. Yeah. Wow, that's very very sweet of him to say that we could do that. Background out so it would be easier to put on things. He's like all about it. What a good guy. Oh, Tony. I love Tony Steele. You guys, I, if, you, if you want to see, if you haven't seen Tony Steele's art, he does amazing kind of uh, cartoon style art, little monsters and dark. No, he, like did, he did a whole and, series of... Uh, of yeah, he's of, got playing cards. He does games for people. He did a whole series of art for uh, Jack Feedback. But uh, I had a, a child come along he's that great. absolutely stunted my ability to work on this project. Um, I have a Pandawan sketch that he did hanging in my house. Yeah. Pa Tony Steele. And then I also have a happy birthday, hippo birthday, pa uh, hippo in my cubicle at work for my birthday this year he sent me. Yeah. What a great guy, that Tony. And, and, and if you have any of the twists, I think for the last th three years of the twists, Music compilation CD. You did oh. the covers for oh, them. Last, last thing. And then. You, you did send. I saw it. I saw did it. Did you hear it? I haven't heard it. Give it a listen. I, it. Okay. I saw it in the f shared file. This is also another drinking it. game. If uh, if uh, Kiki says that she's leaving, and then I manage to keep her from going, or yeah. we, because now Blair's helping me out on this, that's <laughs> when you drink. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go now for real. I know, but you, you will for listen to it. You but you will, will listen, listen right? to it. We'll I will listen. listen to it. Thanks All for right. watching, everybody. Really, really great to see you again. I'm sorry I missed last week, but I'll, I'm back again, and I'll be back again next week. See you again. And Blair and I are gonna record things at the zoo. It's gonna be awesome. So we got more stuff coming for you. Keep watching. Bye. Bye, you guys. Bye. Wait, wait. wait. Do I want to ex? I want to exit. It says confirm exit. Yeah. Exit. It, might go away. it says it will stop this broadcast. Yeah. Okay. Good night, everybody.